Welcome to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast for farmers and ag professionals by the Iowa Farm Bureau, bringing you the news, experts, and educational insights that matter most. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our June 5th edition of The Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and this episode features an in-depth discussion about research-based ways for farmers to build trust with consumers, especially young consumers who fall into the Gen Z demographic. For that, we'll bring on Caitlin Lamb, a member of Iowa Farm Bureau's public relations team who led an award-winning educational farm tour for two young TikTok and Instagram influencers just last fall. Joining Caitlin is Roxy Beck, who's the Director of Consumer Engagement for the Center for Food Integrity. Iowa Farm Bureau has worked closely with the Center for Food Integrity for a number of years now, so you may be familiar with some of the work that CFI has done. CFI brings together a wide variety of food and farming stakeholders, equipping them with the research, trends, engagement, and coalition building that help the entire food system build trust. CFI's membership includes everyone from Iowa Farm Bureau and the American Farm Bureau to Costco, Chick-fil-A, Cargill, Starbucks, Kroger, and Cisco. Over the years, CFI has published a wide array of groundbreaking research on building trust with consumers. And their most recent research piece explores approaches for building trust with Gen Z. For more on that, here's Iowa Farm Bureau's Caitlin Lamb with Roxy Beck of the Center for Food Integrity. All right, well, before we dive into all things Gen Z today, talking about their thoughts on food and therefore agriculture, can you give us a baseline of who this generation is, what age they are, and their characteristics? Yes, Generation Z is one I get excited about maybe because I have one living in my home. But this is a group of people that were born between 1997 and 2012. They're interesting because they're coming into their power. So globally, this generation makes up a third of the global population. And here in the United States, they're, they're just more than 20% of US consumers. That growing into their power, it's estimated that by 2023, they will have $33 trillion of purchasing power. And absolutely, that's going to impact us in the food system because they, like everybody, vote with dollars, but they have some different ways that they're looking for their food to provide a role in their life. Gen Z is uh, the most racially and ethnically diverse generation. By 2026, it's projected that the majority will be non-white. A couple additional pieces about this group. They're less likely to drop out of high school and they're more likely to enroll in college. So the generations that have become before them have helped them understand education is something you need to pursue. And they've seen direct benefits of pursuing that education, understanding more about the world and maybe getting more specialized in it. That ties over to the way that they look at technology and innovation. This group of people has always lived in a world where smartphone technology was at their fingertips. So they are very much a champion for the ways that technology can play a role in their life and solve problems that specifically cater to a need or address a challenge that they're thinking about. And this ties to, we'll, we'll get a bit more into their passion and their what really drives them. I think you could make the case that any generation that's young and kind of coming into adulthood would say, we want to change the world. We want to make sure that we can make, a, you know, make this a better place than it is right now. But this group of people in particular is more driven by social causes than we've seen out of any other generation that we've looked at. And that matters as we think about the food system, because some of those challenges, some of those areas where they think there's really great opportunity for improvement are things like environment, nutrition, health, etc. So they want to have a better world than the one that they believe they're inheriting. And the food system can play a really active and positive role in helping them understand what's already been done, as well as what's to come, again, through things like technology and innovation, which they already have a positive view of. They really are looking to social media, to digital communication, not only to enlighten them, hey, Google, what's the temperature today, right? Those sorts of things, but also to be entertained in that process. And that's why these highly visual and audio-based applications are so appealing to this generation. They 
are so experience driven. And so whether that is literally being in a place and experiencing, you know, touch, taste, smell, those sorts of things, or if they can get that same type of experience through an app or through following people that they have an affinity for or really think are funny or just can provide them something that they think is interesting, they're getting that through digital in a way that didn't exist in this way even 10 years ago. The digital communication landscape is entirely different and influencers in it have figured out how to do it in a way that's incredibly valuable for we, the user. Going back to what you said about Gen Z really having this emphasis on experience. And from CFI research, I've seen that that parallels too and how they view food. So can you expand more on their food beliefs and attitudes? Absolutely. This generation is, quote, hiring food for some different roles in their life. When we think about a big portion of the consumer today, but what we could say, you know, the consumer of the past, of yesteryear, um, those outside of Gen Z. When we think about the Gen Z consumer, they are looking for not just nourishment. They're not just looking for the taste profile. They're not just making sure that it fits their budget, and maybe even the, the challenges they have with health, allergies, maybe there's some heart disease, things like that. Those things are always going to be important to the consumer, independent of what generation they come from. If it doesn't taste good, if it doesn't fit their budget, and if it's not convenient for them to produce or, or um, engage with or cook or prepare that food, they're not going to opt into it. So those are kind of table stakes that we have to make sure that food is consistently available, accessible, affordable, etc. But when we think about Gen Z, the thing that's really different about them is they're looking for food for many other reasons than just that nourishment. The pandemic has helped, I think, all consumers think differently about food's role in health, but this generation in particular is very vested in food as medicine. We started to see this trend coming over the past five years among some other, I would say, kind of early adopter type consumers in, in different generations. But they want to ensure that what they are eating or choosing today doesn't impact their long-term health negatively. It's not just about do the calories I put in my body now or does the protein I choose right now impact my gains for the next week. It's about does this put me at risk you know, in, in a decade from now? Or maybe these people are coming into thinking about being a parent or even some of them are parents. Is this food that I'm choosing going to harm my ability to have children? Is it going to imp impede my ability for my, my future child to have a long, healthy life? So they're thinking about health and food safety and nutrition kind of all as one big bucket. This is an opportunity for us in the food system and those who are specifically focused on nutrition, those dietitians, to really think about partnering with other medical professionals who are getting these types of questions but don't necessarily have the, the focused education and the focused credentials around nutrition. The, the average consumer isn't uncoupling food and nutrition from overall health. Another thing that's really interesting about this group is they're looking to food uh, almost to have a relationship with food. They don't want to have guilt with the food that they choose. They don't want to feel like it's something that they have to fear. And part of that is because this generation has prioritized mental health far above the levels that any other generation has paid attention to it. This group is also thinking about sustainable eating. So they're vested in the future, not only for themselves, but as they think about the planet that they're inheriting. So they're going to be seeking foods that they believe have a lower environmental footprint. They're going to be looking for labels that, that prioritize, you know, not only good for you, but good for the planet. They also think about sustainability, not just in an environmental perspective, but is the system sustainable? So are the people who harvested these tomatoes treated fairly? Are they paid fairly? Are the working conditions fair? Those are the types of things that sustainability, I think in the, the mind of myself, and as I think about agriculture, when we are asked about sustainability, we talk about improvements in efficiencies, lower carbon you know, footprint, things like that. But it's something more holistic to this generation. And I think that's actually beneficial. We have lots of great stories to talk about the improvements that have been made in agriculture to ensure a far more sustainable system as a whole. And in talking about sustainability, yesterday I just saw an article about Oatly. They're basically the leader in oat milk, or maybe I shouldn't say milk, oat 
alternative drink. Juice. I think it's <laughs> what I heard last week. Oat juice. And uh, what they did was they pulled out a bunch of ads on billboards and in print and they bought two spaces and so on and they're right next to each other so on one side it says we bought two billboards on this one we're telling you you know what the environmental footprint is of our drink and then on the other one right next to it it says and we're donating this one to the dairy industry so they can tell you their environmental footprint. And it's got like a milk jug with a question mark on it. And in that article, they specifically mention, you know, marketing this way to Gen Z because of their emphasis on sustainability. So is that is something that's kind of begun, but is that something you think that we can continue to see from brands? The thing about companies that are in front of customers every day who are the branded products that we see in stores is that they have to be competitive in a marketplace where the margins are razor thin. They're a piece of a penny. So where they can say, we do this, this is how we're differentiated. They can do it in alignment with the regulations and laws that allow them or disallow them to claim things on products. As long as they're in compliance, as long as they can prove that what they're saying is true, they will proceed with those types of marketing campaigns. We've seen this in GMOs where companies have said non-GMO on products that never had a GMO opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, green beans, for example, I found in oh, Costco years ago that were non-GMO. And it's like, there are no GMO green beans. So this is where food companies need to start assessing just because something is legal and provable doesn't mean we should market it. And when it comes to some of these sustainability claims, you hear the term greenwashing a lot, you know, where maybe someone's making a claim like, oh, this product has recyclable packaging, but guess what? It's not going to break down for hundreds of years, actually. What's the proof that Gen Z wants when they're talking about sustainability? I think when any consumer thinks about what they can see on a package, what they want, especially as it relates to food and beverages, is they want to feel good about food. They don't want to feel conflicted by the options that they have. We've done, you know, human on the street type interviews for many, many years. And we've had some great sound bites that really boil this down. And it's like, you know, if I have to think about it, I probably don't feel very good about it. But I don't want to think about it. <laughs> or I don't have to think about it. And I mean, here in the United States, what a privilege. What a privilege to not have to think about how food is grown and raised to feel good about participating in it multiple times a day. This Gen Z audience is going to be looking for companies to be forthcoming. It's not enough to have a fact. You have to have information that supports that that fact matters. This is actually something that I think is really good. They want, just in, in terms of their interest in experiential learning, the same is true for the way that they think about access to the system. They don't want to feel like they're being duped. They don't want to feel like anything is hidden. And frankly, with their, you know, being able to access, access the world through a smartphone, they don't believe there's any reason they shouldn't be able to have access to people who are producing their food or distributing their food or processing their food or packaging, right? And we've seen some really interesting types of connections across eaters and influencers and food system in the same way that you see collaborations happening with those TikTok dances. You know, just content creators are connecting with multi-platinum, you know, selling artists and they're saying, oh, here's the dance to your latest song. And all of a sudden that is like wildfire spreading and everybody's doing the dance that was created by a couple, you know, college students in Australia to, you know, somebody who's won every sort of award that you can imagine that there is to win. That's the same type of accessibility that Gen Z is accustomed to seeing, and so they will have a hard time understanding why they can't get access to somebody who can help them understand more. Another positive is those of us that are working in agriculture and throughout the food system have that ability to connect with people who are looking for answers. We also have an opportunity to be very strategic about making sure that what we say, here's what we, what we do, here's what we you know, understand you want, isn't based on what any body of research tells us they want. There has to be a two-way exchange. So part of that 
desire for transparency isn't just, we heard you once or we read the research, so this is the information you get. Thank you very much, close the door, our job is done. That's not how this works. Transparency is a two-way process. So we need to not only say, we think this is what we, they want, we actually need to give them an opportunity to pressure test that information. And we need to be willing enough to open our ears to listen to the new questions that they have that hopefully, and, and through the process of ongoing engagement, will be better informed. They'll use maybe more of the language that we hope that they would, but we have to have tolerance to come into these conversations and say, what have you heard? That's really interesting. What more would you want to know? And then we have to be willing to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to take a risk and say, we're not perfect, but we do things on our farm in a way that's consistent with what we know our animals need, with what is best for our soil, with what the generations of people who've come before and farmed this land, you know, before that ourselves um, have learned and have taught us. When we can do that, and then they can go, oh my goodness, tell me more, I had no idea. We're gonna start to have these ahas that I would say initially are rudimentary, and over time, they're gonna get better about asking questions that are the ones that we really want them to be asking about. But initially, I think the questions being asked are gonna be quite surface level because we've seen it year over year over year over year. And even in the Iowa Farm Bureau's Gen Z tour, as well as a national Gen Z tour that we did in Texas, we saw some ahas that we thought, wow, those were really simple. Those were really basic. <laughs> but what a great situation to have that an aha was, wow, they really, really love their animals. They really care about every animal that's here, even though there are hundreds or thousands of them. Wow, I had no idea that USDA has a, has a regulatory role in this system for every meat you know, processing plant across the United States. Again, these are really simple things that you know people in the industry know, understand, and have known forever. But this is new to the consumer who, one, really is curious, and two, has a vested interest so that they can choose food that's consistent with their beliefs. Yeah, with the Iowa Farm Bureau and CFI tour that we did, the influencer tour, it was really interesting to get insight from these two young ladies who have a, a following on Instagram and TikTok, and they're primarily focused on food, to hear what types of questions they had or what they look for, especially when you talk about transparency. One of them said, oh, I love this specific egg brand because they've got this QR code. I scan the QR code. I know the farmer who produced these eggs. And whereas, you know, me, old millennial, eggs, 99 cents, get in the cart, right? Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting that they do desire that additional level of information, whereas, you know, I just find that I I kind of trust where it came from. But then also in talking about those ahas, and they got to come to Iowa Farms and get that firsthand view. And one of our farmers, Lily, she had a mama cow who gave birth to twins. So the mama cow rejected one of the calves. And so they got to bottle feed that calf, which they thought was amazing, of course, like how cute. But then they also were just like, wow, Lily stepped in was basically the mom to this animal and she's going to be there every step of the way. And so the thing that you would actually want them to leave with, they did just by having that access. And and that's not to say everyone's ready to have someone with a large social media following out on their farm. But I totally hear what you're saying just in seeing that and even, you know, going to a farm where they were really focused on sustainable cropping practices. And they were just mostly impressed by the passion that the farmer had and his willingness to try different things and just this legacy of conservation. And yeah, let's see what happens. And now that I know what happens, I'm going to share it with other farmers so we can keep the ball rolling. But yeah, the questions that they asked in the transparency that they wanted was pretty prevalent. Yeah. I'll never forget the first influencer tour that we did more than a decade ago, 15 years ago. It was an experiment at that time. This wasn't something that was done frequently. Yes, you know, different organizations have invited the community out to have the breakfast on the farm. But this was different because it was a behind the scenes, you know, kind of backstage pass, ask every question, take any picture, you know, do all the things that you might want to do on a farm and in other areas of the food system that we that we toured. But I recall standing around with, I think it was about 10 bloggers, you know, in the influencers um, of old, 
And they were highly, highly vested in the food system. They were foodies at the core. And the farmer, we were on the farm, and it was a father and son, and they were talking about, you know, how they choose seeds for the next season and, you know, some of the growing conditions that we had in that state. And the term GMO was mentioned. And I saw through that process, one of the influencers' faces was just looking worried, just looking concerned in some way. And so, again, this was all very experimental. This was the first one where we had done, and we were really trying to hone in on some of these issues that we knew were consumer-facing and were going to be a bit controversial or sciencey. You know, it was, it was going to get into a deeper level of discussion. And so I was really paying keen attention to what was going on. And it just got to the point where I just thought it couldn't wait. And so I kind of went over and just said, hey, are you okay? And she said, I just can't believe this. And I thought, okay, brace for it. <laughs> Here it comes. And she said, I just can't believe this. He could be my grandpa. This guy is like so loving and caring. And I just, I didn't expect this. And so my perception about what was going on in her head was 100% wrong. I thought she was hearing terms like pesticides, GMOs, flood, drought, she was getting worried about all these different things she was hearing that are going on um, that are, you know, in, in the decision making process for the farmer. And her aha was these are good people. These are like people I know and love. You know, it's not just like this is somebody I've met. This is somebody who I care for deeply. They have that heart. And from there, it was like, OK, good. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure everything was OK. But to your point about bringing people having them experience what we see in agriculture day in, day out, if the biggest aha they have is, oh, wow, these are good people who care for animals or who are thinking about what's best for the land, we've won because that is who we are. And we're not, not every person in agriculture is a communicator or who has that as their main job. They're there because they have a passion for land and animals and, you know, bringing nourishment to families all across the world. And so, as much as we can start with who we are and what drives us, that will be a win because that's what any consumer is looking for, independent of what generation they sit in. And I know with CFI research, and it's something that we talk about with our farming members a lot too, is that idea of shared values. So going back to what you said, like, you know, maybe not necessarily what you do, but who you are. Yeah, it has more to do with how do you make decisions? If I know you have a good heart, if I know you've prioritized things that are important to me, then certainly you're going to make decisions through that lens. You're going to run through those filters and come up with a decision that is well-informed because you are a true expert, but two, has gone through the heart filter <laughs> because you're a good person. And yes, the CFI research that we did more than a decade ago, it's our, our peer-reviewed and published model on how you build trust. It's two types of information that the consumer wants and needs to know that we're, we're making decisions that are trustworthy. And the, the first type of information is that that is about competence. It's this fact, science, knowledge, skills. You know, it's that type of information that says we know what we're doing and it's based in fact. The other type of information we know works and has to be there is that information that our researcher, Dr. Steve Sapp from Iowa State, said has to do with, he called it confidence. And it's a perception of shared values. Are you a person like me? Do you make decisions in the way that I do? Do you prioritize and care about the things that I do? Those two types of information are very accessible to us because people in agriculture are incredibly focused and passionate and doing the right thing. And they're also very much experts in their own right for the types of farming that they do. So we f we ask that further question. So do we just need to, you know, share a fact, share who we are, share a fact, share who we are? And the reality is the research showed us that independent of the topic we're talking about, values are three to five times more important than facts when we show up and we try to build trust. What that doesn't mean is facts aren't important. We need two types of information. Facts are one of those two. But what it means is we have to lead with who we are and what's important to us because that guides how we apply those facts to our operations. So I always say be a person first and an expert third, not because I'm bad at math, but because <laughs> just because we have to show up with our heart and who we are a couple times, you know, to help them understand that then when we have those facts, we apply them in that order. So when we can showcase both, we're winning because they are looking for people who know more than they do and who have dedicated their life to the study of this kind of thing, but also, again, have that value similarity. 
in working with our farm members on advocacy and just connecting with people. The way you say it sounds easy, right? But it requires this total shift. Even sometimes when I'm helping farmers write a letter to the editor just about the great things that are happening on their farm, they like to talk generally. Oh, farmers are doing this. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm asking about you, though. People want to know about you. And it's hard for them to want to put themselves in the story. But you're saying that's basically more important than ever, probably regardless of generations, but maybe more so with Gen Z. It's important because when they are, again, back to the smartphone, when they're accessing people online, they're getting individuals. It's one, you know, oftentimes one person at a time. So if we can't show up and say, hey, here's my story, or here's what's true for me, then it seems disingenuous. They also know, even when we do bo bodies of research like this, Gen Z thinks this, or Gen Z, we know that once you've met one farmer, you've met one farmer, <laughs> not every farmer. The same thing is true for them. So it's important that we can show up and say, you know, as, as an industry, we're really working hard on this. On my farm, here's what we do. I think they will appreciate and respect the reality that is you can't speak for every farmer, nor should you, but also that we can help them understand every farm is different. And in fact, every field may be different. You know, if you cross a, a gravel road, then the nutrients that exist on one side of that road are going to be different than those on the other. And every plant that we put or every seed that we put in that field might require a different type of approach. So when we can start to be more individualized, then they could start to understand that we also need to be given that grace when they ask questions broadly. And when I say they, when the food system and when people put pressure on the food system, ask questions about, are you sustainable, we have not only an obligation, but a right to say, this is what sustainability looks like on my operation. Yes, here's what I'm tracking. Here's how we're improving. We know that these are the, you know, these are the things that have been improved over time, and we know we're not perfect. And so we're going to continue to do our part to ensure we can be as sustainable as possible. You can do that very eloquently and very easily without saying, oh, you can't even believe how unsustainable we used to be, <laughs> right? <laughs> We've, we know more just through science of, of everything we do and access in our life. We know things today are generally better or improved from the technologies that existed before. And the way that we run our operations is absolutely that way. So we don't have to say, yep, we're at fault for doing things in the past in the way we knew how and the way science you know, best informed us to do. What we can say is we have a great interest because you know what? This is a farm that I've been on and my family has farmed for four generations. And my hope is that it can be here for at least four generations more. That says the same thing. That doesn't get into the metrics. It says, I care. I have a vested interest to keep this going, and I have a heart because I want, you know, the, the people who come after me in this family or, you know, whomever end up on this operation, I want them to have a slice of this life. I want them to be able to contribute in the same way I did. So where you can get specific and talk about your individual operation and specifically the things that you have found through a process of discovery to be important, absolutely raise those up. But understand, you don't have to tell people every single thing. One, they're not going to be able to understand it. In any group of experts we work with, a major problem is you know too much. <laughs> and we laugh when we say that because you have to know so much to do your job so well. But when you compare that to somebody who, you know, we try to convey that to somebody who doesn't know what you know, we get ourselves into trouble because we start saying, you know, words that don't make sense, that they've never heard, that they're trying to understand as we're saying them. So start simple. And if they want more, they will absolutely ask for more. They are going to be curious. They won't be shy, you know, to ask. So just be willing to be with them in that process. When you talk about knowing too much, we have a really great couple who are Farm Bureau members, and it's a husband and wife, and the husband grew up on the dairy farm, and the wife came from the city, married the farmer, you know, mm -hmm. typical, beautiful yep. Iowa love story. <laughs> and she almost describes that not knowing as her superpower because she can connect to moms or other people because she's not digging into the weeds. She knows what they want to know and can connect with that. And it's also funny when you talk about not having to put down like previous generations for what we know now, because I was just having that conversation with a colleague this morning. And with each iteration of research or technology, we can continue to make things better. And that doesn't necessarily mean like what people before were doing was wrong. It was just 
doing the best with what they had. But because Gen Z is so ingrained in technology and we do see agriculture having a lot of leading innovation, how can we connect those things, especially when we're talking about the concerns that they have about the food system? I think one of the best tools that we have in our proverbial back pocket is analogies. We have seen so many medical advancements. When you think about, even if you looked up at the framing of when Gen Zers were born until today, think about the advancements in medical technologies, treatments for things, you know, terrible diseases. When we can tie something to real advancements for human health, we've seen a direct correlation then if those same technologies can be applied in agriculture. Consumers of all ages, but again, especially Gen Z, are very, very positive about those. They want for advancements across other industries to be used creatively to innovate and improve things in other industries. So that collaboration and, the again, the advancements that we can say we've learned, they're in the world all around them. Let's leverage those. I think about even being a mom of two, even the changes between having a child in 2009 and then 2011, there were major advancements in ultrasound technology that happened in just those two years where I went, holy cow, this was amazing. They may not have that direct, you know, certainly maybe not my experience there, but but they're going to have seen or could be tuned into advancements that happened in, say, a decade of a, a time span that they have lived in to help them understand it's the same thing that's happening in agriculture. So while we make decisions based on what is known today, there are scientists who are, are always working collaboratively across the, you know, academicians and people in, you know, food companies and in seed development companies and in drone technology to try to improve the overall end product. So I think that's a huge tool that we have. I think the other thing, you know, an obvious one, we likely have those smartphones in our hands too. So even if your first step is to listen, to observe, leverage some hashtags, you know, go on to some of these platforms. You might not want to go on TikTok. You might not want to sign up for everything. But in terms of what social media channels Gen Z is using most prevalent, understand that TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube are the top of their list. You, and YouTube and Instagram for um, millennials are also very, very popular. 75% of Gen Zers are using YouTube once a day. 59% of Gen Zers are using either TikTok or Instagram once a day. So those are vehicles, those are channels that we can tap into and go, what is the information that's out there? Something to do on, on a rainy day when you can't get out and plant, you know, can't get out and, and plant or harvest. Go in and, and type in a term you don't like, a keyword or a phrase into these, any one of these channels and see what pops up and understand that people are searching for that. And if our voice isn't there when they're wondering about animal care or animal abuse or animal agriculture, what's wrong? If we don't show up and if we don't start to leverage hashtags that people who don't like what we're doing and who frankly aren't involved at all in agriculture, then we know we're going to be losing. So we have to first understand what is the information that's out there, and then we can start to perhaps get comfortable about how do I fit into this. In agriculture, there are so many really great people who are actively involved on these different channels and have a great way of providing educational information and insights who showcase what it is really like to be a farmer and make decisions and be riddled with debt and, you know, all of the hard things that happen and to be at the mercy of nature oftentimes. And also they entertain. They do it in a way that is very approachable. And so if you can strike that balance, I think you've got something really special and important. I would say another thing, too, is this generation actually can handle longer form content. The millennial generation, it was like, if you couldn't convey it in 30 seconds or less, you kind of lose. This generation is proving that they're actually watching these longer form, you know, pieces of content. So while there will be the continued, you know, scroll, 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 you know, keep moving past each of the different, you know, pieces of content, they are using these vehicles, these channels in the way that I would use Google. So they're using TikTok to find information. And then if that information suits you know, their interests, they're watching those longer form pieces of content in the same way that you might watch a documentary. So I think those are a couple of things. We, we've got to get comfortable with being accessible 
and here's one other urging. I was just um, at Animal Ag Alliance Summit last week and had an opportunity to travel home on the same plane as an Iowa pork producer. And so we had some good conversations about what does it look like to engage Gen Z? You know, what, what are some of the concerns? What are some of the must-dos? And one of the things that he's done on his operation is he's empowered the next generation to do it. He said, I'm not going to do the same things that they would do. I'm not going to speak in the same way. I'm not going to come up with half the content, you know, or the topics they would. But they do it, and it's amazing. And the engagement they get just helps me understand that I would be in the way if I tried to be involved. So I try to make sure, you know, the next gen has what they need to be able to showcase what we're doing because I would be an impediment to us getting our truth out there. And, and he said, and frankly, we have nothing to hide. So if we can get to that spot as well, feeling like this isn't a threat, this is an opportunity, our whole mindset shifts and then we can think really strategically about, okay, so what are the different angles that we can talk about or showcase or maybe even invite a group of people out to come see. So we kind of have some topic ideas now. Let's say you're not ready for, you know, TikTok or whatever it may be at a basic human level, what is a good strategy to connect with this generation? We know that we have to pass that basic bar of taste and price and convenience. If we want to really connect with Gen Z, we also have to talk about food safety and long-term health. We have to talk about how nutrition makes your life better. We have to talk about environmental stewardship and how it is impactful not only for farming and agriculture's future, but also for the future of the food system. Don't hesitate to talk about the technologies that you're working on day in and day out, that you're sampling, that you're pressure testing or thinking about. And even if you can you know, fly a drone and show them what your farm looks like from the top, if you can do any of those little things to help them understand not just that you're using technology, but that you're doing it because it suits an outcome that they're interested in, that's a place to start. So understanding, you know, most importantly, that this generation is thinking about food and nutrition and long-term health and safety. They're thinking about sustainability. That's where you start the story. Don't make that the last thing you say, make it the first thing. As somebody who deeply cares about the sustainability of this farm, because I you know, I received this piece of land. I want it to be able to be in our family for many, many years to come and to be, you know, a thriving farm, producing lots of nutrients for people all over. This is something I have deep interest in. Here are a couple things I'm doing. Some of them might be very, very traditional. Some of them might be, you know, buffer strips and, you know, making sure that we do, you know, no-till, things like that. And some of them might be highly advanced technology. I would say talk about all of them, but talk about them in short sentences. Talk about them just at the basics and then start that two-way dialogue so that you understand if that's something that they're interested in or not. And so we talked about the diversity of this group and how they are very cause-driven and all the things that they think about when it comes to food. Where should we start in our communications? My advice for how to pursue your first engagements with Gen Z is to go into it with great amounts of patience. You can't have your end goal be Gen Z now knows everything I know or understands exactly how I've made every decision that I've made. Understand that going into this process will be that, a process, it will be a journey. But if you can have enough patience to not listen to the words they use or not be offended by the questions they ask, you can start to really understand what is driving them. They might ask or use specific phrases or terms that are just wrong. They might couple together a couple issues or topics that have nothing to do with each other. But if you can start to get underneath those issues or those topics, you can start to see their heart. You can start to understand, oh, wow, they're asking all these questions about ingredients and pesticides and what we put on the land or what goes into those animals. Maybe they're interested to understand more about food health or maybe it's nutrition or maybe it's because they have an allergy and they're trying to avoid a lot of stuff that they don't know how it's going to impact their body. If you can start by listening not to the topic, but what might be the underlying cause, that's going to allow you to ask really good questions about. That's really interesting. And we hear lots of questions around the topic of GMOs and pesticides and chemicals. Help me understand why that's important to you. 
when you can ask that question about well, how, why is that on your mind or why is that, you know, why does that make you nervous? Then they're going to start to get to that underlying driver. Well, and you're going to start to hear stories. When my youngest sister, you know, all of a sudden had anaphylaxis, we had to really think differently about, you know, the foods that my parents were buying. And so now that's something that I'm thinking about because it makes me nervous. Okay, health concerns, that's what they're focused on. When you start to get underneath, then you can start to answer those questions in a way that's aligned with, again, their values and their needs. Never forget that consumers want to feel good about their food. They want to go into the grocery store or the farmer's market or the meat case, you know, to the meat case. They want to feel confident that they have what they need to choose the food that is best for them. Food labels, the internet, <laughs> TikTok influencers, all of that are going to be other sources that they're going to put through a filter and say, do I have what I need to make this decision? So the more we can get in front of them, the more we can give grace when they don't ask the question that we want them to or that's not phrased in the way that we know it should be means that we're going to have a much better end opportunity to earn their trust and keep it over time because people in agriculture do the right thing all the time. And the same is true for people all throughout the food system. So where we can give them a reason to believe absolutely the food that you're choosing is safe, the people that it comes from are good people, and ask any question, keep us in that conversation, I think is a win. Engaging a younger non-farm audience isn't always easy, and it can take you way outside of your comfort zone. But it's so important to the future of agriculture, so I hope you picked up some strategies from Roxy that will help you feel more equipped to do that. If you'd like to dig deeper into the Center for Food Integrity's Gen Z research or any of the other research they've done on trust building, we've included links to that information in the notes for this podcast episode. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. We hope you found it insightful and that you'll join us for the next one on June 19th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau. And thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.